こんにちはオキロフェイシャルクリニック東京院長の鹿島智之です今回のがん形成手術研究会のウェブセミナーは趣向を変えて海外の有名なドクターに講演をしてもらうということをしたいと思いますインターナショナルレクチャーと題して日本の先生方に海外の知見を知ってもらいたいと思っています記念すべき第1回目のゲストスピーカーは私鹿島が米国留学でお世話になったゴールドバーグ先生ですゴールドバーグ先生は眼科への経血膜アプローチや深部外壁の眼科減圧術など非常にたくさんの新知見を発表し世界的に最も有名な眼形整形会の一人ですまたアメリカ国内だけでなく世界中にフェローがいてそのフェローはその国の眼形成の第一人者になっています今回の講演は1本目が甲状腺がん症で眼球突出した患者への眼科減圧術2本目が上眼腱・下眼腱への眼形成手術3本目が望ましくない結果となった患者への対応という内容になっていますそれではゴールドバーグ先生よろしくお願いいたします OK So, the first lecture I'm going to give is about orbital decompression. Let me give an overview of the principles, the technique, and some of the concepts.、Uh, this is Tommy and baby Oki when we went to visit the poppies, remember, in California? It was really nice. And we have a course every year at UCLA,、uh, the aesthetic facial course. Tommy was the instructor once, and this is a course that has live cadaver and lectures.、Uh, it's a small, limited participation. It sells out quickly, so pay attention to the announcement. If you, and we would be glad to have some people come from Japan. We've had visitors from Japan before. Let's talk first about the indications for orbital decompression.、Uh, Disfiguring proptosis, globe entrapment, congestive orbitopathy, compressive optic neuropathy, and preparation for eyelid muscle surgery. When I was a fellow, orbital decompression was really thought of as a fairly drastic surgery, mostly for cases like this with、uh, globe entrapment, where the eye eyeball gets entrapped in front of the eyelids. But what we realize now is that. Rehabilitation over the prominent eye is, is not perfect. It's not really effective. And to get our patients back to the pre morbid appearance, it often requires moving the eye back in the eye socket with orbital decompression, as seen here. But if we're going to be more aggressive in our approach, It's important to try to reduce the complications. And I think one of the most significant complications of decompression is the new onset strabismus. And so, as I have developed decompression surgery over my career, I've tried to work on techniques that decrease the risk of consecutive strabismus. The anatomy of decompression is really pretty straightforward. There's just certain surfaces available. In the medial orbit, we have the ethmoid and maxillary sinus. In the lateral orbit, we have the sphenoid and a little bit of the frontal bone. And to get to those areas of bone, there's a number of anatomic accesses. Traditionally, these accesses were,、uh, I guess, claimed. By different specialties, so that the neurosurgeons would come in and they would take the sphenoid bone from an open craniotomy. The head and neck surgeons would come in, usually through the maxillary sinus, and take the floor and medial wall. Ophthalmologists would take the anterior lateral wall. But all of those areas of bone are. Approach, can be approached by ophthalmologists through hidden incisions. 
Now, I said earlier that we try to develop techniques that decrease the incidence of strabismus. So, which approaches cause the most strabismus? Well, the unbalanced inframedial causes the most strabismus. Although Tomiyuki uh, in, in Korea last, last week, uh, Malin Nike, your, your co-fellow, uh, talked about un, his experience with medial wall only decompression. And he showed a fairly low rate of strabismus. And there have been a few other series that have shown that. So I'm a little bit open-minded that maybe it's possible to uh, work medially and not get as much decompression, uh, not get as much double vision. But I still think that the la balanced lateral or deep lateral wall alone has the least risk of double vision. And I think the least risk of all is just removing fat only. So the, the paradigm that I use for that reason, I always start with orbital fat is the first wall, if you will, the deep lateral second, medial third, and the uh, floor is the fourth wall, depending on how much proptosis reduction we need. One thing that I've learned is that proptosis reduction is not the only important outcome. In reducing congestion and relieving the pressure of compressive orbitopathy actually may be the most valuable benefit of decompression. Uh, a patient like this with, with uh, edema, it improves a little bit over time, but also the swelling and the edema improve after decompression. And to reduce the pressure pain and the swelling you don't have to do a really big decompression, right? You've, you've taught me that. A small decompression is often adequate. Here's another thing that you learn as you get, start to get gray hair. I start to see my own patients after 20 years, and they come in with late enophthalmus. At, you know, we all tend to get a little bit of enophthalmus as we get older anyway. And I think in the Graves patients, Tommy, that fat you know, congestion, it slowly unwinds as the years and decades go by. And so now, I, I tend to undercorrect the surgery a little bit. Because, you know, I don't try, in a young patient, I don't try to get complete reduction of proptosis, because I think over the next 10 to 20 years, the eye will set back, and I don't want to age them prematurely. So I'm a little bit more conservative. So let's talk about this first wall of intraconal fat. Uh, Tommy, it, as you know, we like to do that with uh, local anesthesia, right? Monitored local anesthesia. We go in through a conjunctival approach. We can remove a little bit of the bone of the zygoma with a curette in this area around the inferior orbital fissure. And then to remove the fat, I often just use a suction technique. I'll spread the fat a little bit with the scissor, and then with the 10 French suction, just take the, the fat out once it's broken up. And this is very comfortable for the patient. Really just with a little bit of a local block, they do fine. Here's another example of that. So conjunctival approach. Right, and we expose the fat. I try to leave the most anterior fat intact, go back into the intraconal space, to try to keep from getting hollow. But here's another example, using a little bit of scissor dissection, and then the suction uh, sucks out the fat. Now, if for the next level we do deep lateral transorbital transcranial decompression, remember I showed you that traditionally the ophthalmologists took the zygoma, the anterior orbital wall. But, you know, first of all, this doesn't give much decompression because it's mostly by the equator of the globe. And in fact, what it can do is it can move the eye laterally. Tanuj Nakra, in his thesis, looked at the lateral displacement of the globes. You know, as the globe comes forward, it comes forward on the axis, on the 45-degree axis. So the eyes, the eyeballs widen. And I think that widened look is part of the disfigurement of, of orbital of of thyroid orbitopathy. This patient was just treated with steroids, but can you see how the eyes move in just with the reduction in proptosis?
So I would argue the last thing you want to do is remove the bone that would allow the eye to come laterally. So I actually carefully leave bone around Whitnall's tubercle. Instead, the, the thick bone that we remove in lateral decompression is the same bone that the neurosurgeons used to remove from the cranial approach. It's this uh, thick bone of the greater wing of the sphenoid right here in the, di in the diploic space that we remove for maximal decompression. Here's the traditional ophthalmic decompression where it stops. But all of this bone is actually the bone that we like to remove. Uh, now, what should we do with the lateral wall? Uh, some people like to remove the wall and put it back. By the way, these are the plates from the 1990s, just to show you we were talking, Tommy, about where the field has gone. I mean, this was the technology that we had when I started really big screws and plates. But the problem with removing the lateral wall, some people like to remove it and leave it. I, I don't agree with that because when you leave the wall off, I think you get a little bit of an hourglass deformity. So instead, I like to leave the wall intact and I drill down the river of diplo like this, uh, and then I'll take a little bit of the bone of the zygoma, exposing a little bit of the maxillary sinus and the buccal fat. So this is a, actually, a June Hosahata made this video when he was the fellow. <laughs> so June, if you're watching, I still use your video. But uh, this is the, that thick bone that can be removed uh, and I used to do that through a coronal approach early on. But the problem with the coronal approach is that you can get temporalis wasting from taking the muscle out. Here's a patient with, with, with temporalis wasting after that open coronal approach. So nowadays, I almost always just use an eyelid crease incision. In a young Japanese or East Asian patient, I'll sometimes make the incision in the canthus because this may not heal as well. So either canthal or eyelid crease incision. And then this is what the surgery looks like. We start with a periosteal dissection, lift the periosteum off the bone. Actually here I'm just opening the orbicularis muscle a little bit, feeling the rim. And now you can see we've exposed the lateral orbital rim. We'll clean off a little bit of the muscle, and then we'll make a periosteal incision just, just outside the arcus marginalis because we don't want to spill the orbital fat. Once we've exposed the bone, then we go ahead with a subperiosteal dissection. The periosteum, as you know, is often adherent right at the arcus marginalis where the septum comes off right on the edge. So we try to go very carefully there to keep the periosteum intact because one of the main advantages of this external approach is that you don't spill orbital fat. So you have a pretty clean look back to the apex. And then we expose the superior orbital fissure, which you can see here. So there's the superior orbital fissure and that gives us a landmark where the uh, deep bone is going to be. Next, I like to remove the bone from what I call the lacrimal keyhole. So instead of taking off the rim, I sculpt the inside of the rim so that I can get a clean view back to the apex. The other advantage of taking, off, taking out this bone of the lacrimal keyhole is that it makes a space so that the lacrimal gland can expand outwards. And it's a very safe area of drilling. You know, you're not near any dura. Next, we go back towards the superorbital fissure. And here, we're trying to find the diploic space. The diplo will ooze a little bit, but with a, with a rough diamond burr, you can often uh, coagulate that oozing as you go. So now we've exposed the, uh, you, you can see I'm taking a little bit more. I'm taking the cliff now of the inside of the, the deepest part of the sphenoid bone to make a good space for the orbit to decompress. And we've shown in, in papers that there's as much as two or three ml of bony volume in the deep orbit. Some patients have more than others, and it's always helpful to look at the CT scan or MR before surgery 
so that you can anticipate how much bone there will be. And in some patients that have very small diploic space, I, I sometimes won't do the lateral decompression. Is that what you do also? Yeah, right, a little bit. But the nice thing about taking off this bone is that this is the bone directly behind the eye, so it allows the entire orbit to uh, move posteriorly. And this is that study we did looking at the amount of bone in each of the areas. There can be quite a bit of bone volume in the lateral orbit. And importantly, when we studied consecutive strabismus, we found that the rate of consecutive strabismus with lateral decompression was very low. One change that I've made over the past, I guess, five or seven years is that in young patients, when I want to get maximum decompression, I used to leave eggshell bone over the dura. And the reason for doing that wasn't that I was scared to expose the dura, but I thought that if you open that up, the brain would come into the orbit and make less space. But what we showed in a paper with Yi Wang in Beijing is that actually the opposite happens. When you look, the orbit actually takes over the intracranial space, you get more room. Here's the, here's the study that looked at that. So nowadays, uh, I will routinely uh, take, in, in a young patient in particular, young, a young patient is defined as younger than me, so <laughs> they, it, it gets older every year. But in, let's say a patient, you know, in their, below the late 60s, uh, I think it's very safe to expose the dura. The risk is, is low. And you can get quite a bit of extra room by exposing the uh, cranial space. So, let's see, can I? Not sure I was going to have, I could move this forward, but that's okay. We're, we're just seeing the same thing again. But repetition is good for teaching. So, so here we are uh, opening up the periosteum the way that we showed earlier, carefully dissecting the arcus marginalis. And now we get right back to the superior orbital fissure. By the way, it's very helpful to take the subperiosteal dissection all the way down to the floor of the orbit because that 180 degree periosteal dissection allows you to see deep in the orbit. Okay, so good. So now we're looking, beautiful look right at the superorbital fissure. Do you see it there? And so now this is the high speed diamond burr and we're using that to remove the uh, greater wing of the sphenoid. But now you'll see I'm going to take this all the way out to the middle cranial fossa dura right back to the supraorbital fissure. By the way, that approach of taking the entire sphenoid bone is also useful for deep orbital tumors when you need to get back to the apex because it gives you very good exposure of the uh, deepest part of the orbit. Also, you can see with that diamond burr, it makes a little bit of heat, and so it, it keeps it pretty blood-free. The marrow can ooze, but I find if I use the drill Sometimes I'll even not, I'll use less irrigation if it starts to ooze so that on purpose we get a little bit of heat and that helps with the uh, hemostasis as we go through this soft marrow. So now as we get back towards the dura, you'll see that the, we can, you can often hear the difference and feel it just a little bit gradually working back. So here's the superorbital fissure, here's the roof of the orbit, and here's that greater wing of the sphenoid. You can see how we can really make a very nice uh, bony cavity. And there we go. Now, now you're looking at a little bit of dura. Do you see it right there? Once you see the a little bit of dura, then you can work all the way around it pretty quickly because you have a good, you have a good view of, of where the level is. And the other way to take out that bone, once you have the dura exposed, is you can use a rongeur. In addition, see how I've got a rongeur with one blade against the uh, dura, one blade out. Do you see that? So we can start to expand that dural opening, and we can make a fairly big opening. Kashima Falls, right? The second wall is the medial wall. Now here we take advantage of the ethmoid 
uh, air cells and maxillary air cells. I always tell the fellows that there's not very many opportunities that we have to kill patients in orbit surgery, but this is one of them. Because if we go through the fovea ethmoidalis and pick off the anterior cerebral artery that rests right here, that can be a fatal intracranial complication with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so it's very important to respect and know the anatomy of the fovea ethmoidalis or the roof of the air cells. Years ago, people used to make a Lynch incision, uh, which was on the skin. I've always thought, I don't know who Professor Lynch was, but I've always thought that if he could get his name on that incision, then Henry Bayless should be able to get his name on the caruncular incision, which is much more elegant. The transcaruncular incision is a very, very quick way to get back to the orbit. We just uh, make a little bit of a cut right in the conjunctival caruncle and uh, dissect posteriorly along Horner's muscle. The only anatomy here that's at risk is the lacrimal system because the lacrimal sac is just, you know, here's the posterior lacrimal crest, so the lacrimal sac is just, just anterior. So we have to always find our way back on Horner's muscle, which you can see here, to the posterior crest, and then dissect back from, from that point. So here we make the caruncular opening. And then what I like to do is just a little bit of blunt, oh, first of all, I like to make the opening from punctum to punctum, so that you have a nice wide conjunctival opening. And then just a little bit of blunt dissection, you can feel the posterior lacrimal crest, the little bump of it. And then you can just, the scissor tip rests right there on the posterior crest. And then we can spread just a little bit, cut and spread, and then put a malleable right down the plane of the scissors. And what ends up happening is you're looking right at uh, Horner's muscles. So there's the malleable going in, the assistant can put a little rake there. And now, can you see, here's Horner's muscle, and here's the posterior lacrimal crest that show up very nicely there. We clean off a little tiny bit of the, uh, I guess, you know, per super periosteal tissue until we can really see the bone. And then here's the most important point that I try to teach the fellows. You really need a wide periosteal incision. So the first thing that I do, sometimes with a little bit of cutting cautery, is open up the periosteum at the posterior crest. And then I'll use a sharp elevator and really widen this. So I'll take it way up towards the trochlea, but posterior to the trochlea, and way down to the floor of the orbit so that we have a really wide periosteal opening. The point of that periosteal opening is that then that acts as a shield for the orbital fat. Once, once that's open, then we can very quickly get back to the anterior ethmoid artery, identify it, uh, cauterize it if needed, and then finish the uh, decompression. And then we'll go back and take the entire ethmoid bone all the way back to the uh, palatine bone. So here's the way that looks. You can see that we've exposed the, there's a little bit of cautery on the artery. We've exposed the whole medial wall. And now it's pretty easy to uh, enter the ethmoid sinus. And by the way, I always like to enter the ethmoid sinus low because it's just better to stay away from the roof. Enter, enter the sinus down near the maxillary sinus and then work up towards the fovea ethmoidalis. And this is soft bone that's usually easily removed just with a Takahashi or Blake's leaf forcep. Uh, another way to take care of the medial wall is endoscopically, and I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but at UCLA, remember, we, you know, we do our own endoscopic orbital decompressions. I think that's entirely within the scope of an ophthalmologist who's trained in the anatomy. In some centers, the ophthalmologist will work with a head and neck surgeon. But you know, certainly you get a nice view th with the endoscope. I still think, Tommy, for a simple case, it's just easier to do a, a crunkler approach. I always say that I'm having coffee while they're finishing setting up the endoscope, right? And, and a medial decompression takes, 
15 minutes, right? It's a pretty quick case from the orbit, and it's a hidden incision. So I'm not sure I understand where there's a big advantage to that. Now the third wall is the posterior floor. Remember we like to leave the maxillary sinus strut, but there's some deep bone at the posterior part of the strut. Here's a, when we've taken out the, uh, here's the sphenoid wall, maxillary wall, and there's this triangle of bone in the inframedial orbit, which is the palatine bone. We can go all the way back to the palatine bone to get a maximum posterior decompression. And sometimes there's a little bit of an air cell that aerates the palatine bone that gives us a little bit of extra room right in that area. Here's a picture of that aerated palatine bone and showing that you know, we can get a little bit of room. So surgery is graded on the amount of proptosis and congestion. For a severely congested orbit, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, for a mild congested orbit with mild to moderate proptosis, we'll do minimally invasive local anesthesia decompression with intraconal fat and a little bit of the hand carved bone. And you can see that result here. For moderate proptosis with a woody orbit, we'll go on with a deep lateral decompression uh, through an eyelid crease incision with general anesthesia, and that can get us four or five or six millimeters of decompression. For the most severe proptosis, we'll combine the deep lateral and medial decompression balanced, and that can get as much as six to eight millimeters of proptosis reduction as seen in these patients. For optic neuropathy, I often just use an isolated transcoronicular approach, go back and take the posterior ethmoid. That can be done under local anesthesia. It can be a 15-minute case or with a general anesthesia. It's very important when you're, doing a, uh, when you're decompressing the optic nerve for, for compressive neuropathy to go all the way back to the sphenoid junction. Right? Remember how many times I taught you that, Tommy? Because if you miss that bone and they still have neuropathy, you have to come back, right? So you want to get that the first time. And then also for non-Graves proptosis, we'll also use this technique. We'll take intraconal fat. For example, in this congenital patient with a large myopic eye, uh, we just remove some of the fat cosmetically. And actually, I used the fat and placed it in the orbital rim. So we brought the rim forward a little bit in the eye back. Post-blepharoplasty retraction with the prominent eye. Often, I'll remove some of the intraconal fat to try to reduce some of the relative proptosis seen here. So to summarize, we talked about the paradigm, orbital fat, lateral wall, medial wall, and deep floor in that order as needed. And just to complete the points, I think the congestive orbitopathy responds well to decompression. It's an important indication for surgery. I like this minimal incision graded approach, which is designed to avoid scarring and to minimize strabismus. And surgery is always graded based on the need going down the step ladder of decompression uh, as required for the individual patient and being a little bit conservative, as, as I said, not trying to over, being careful not to over decompress. I hope that's a helpful summary, Tom. I hope that's going to be useful for the audience. And I sure appreciate being uh, invited. Thank you.